Hey, how's it going? My name is Reese Moss and in today's training, I'm going to be walking through the client acquisition beginner to expert masterclass. It's taken me a while to create and essentially what I'm going to be running you through today is everything that you need to know when it comes to client acquisition to grow a social media marketing agency or pretty much any agency for that matter, any service based business, but mostly you know, I, I focus on working with agencies, so this is going to apply to you mostly. Now, this is going to be a long training, so make sure that you've got some water, make sure you've got a pen and paper. The best way to go through this training as I record it is, yes, I'm going to be going through it in one, but the way that you should approach it is rewind if you don't understand, because what's going to happen is I'm going to be building on top of everything. I'm going to start at the really simple question of what is client acquisition? I'm going to define even what a business is. We're talking beginner, beginner level, all the way to being an expert. And when I say an expert, I truly mean that today you will receive the full game plan, everything that you need to acquire clients predictably and consistently for your agency or service-based business. So really, really excited to get into this. Uh, so yeah, let's do it. Before I do, as I said, everything builds up on top of the previous line, pretty much the previous thing that I'm going to say. So with that in mind, if you're confused, if there's something you don't understand, rewind, take it back 10, 15 seconds, make sure you understand what I've said before moving forward. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's get into it. So this here is the client acquisition beginner to expert masterclass. And we're going to run through this together today. So first things first, what is client acquisition? Well, client acquisition is the process of a business acquiring clients. A client is somebody who the business pays money for something. This could be a service, a product, or something else. But either way, a client is only a client if there's an exchange of money for something that the business provides. Now, businesses generally exist because they have something that the client wants, and so they buy it from the business. Ultimately, people buy things that help them achieve their goals or ideal situations. Now, instead, in sales and in psychology, we can refer to this as states. And in this training, I'll be using the word states and situations, you know, uh, in, in the same in the same context, they mean the same thing for today's training. So there are two main types of states that people ultimately want and ultimately buy from businesses They're they're looking for two different states, they're looking for emotional states and tangible states. Now, emotional states are how people feel. This is them feeling confused, agitated, happy, satisfied, confident, successful, etc. It's the emotions that people are feeling on the inside. And specifically, if somebody wants a state, they want to feel those emotions. On the other side of states, there's tangible, tangible states. And these are things visible on the surface. These are things like making 10K a month with your agency, a system of predictably scheduling meetings, buying a Lamborghini, having an apartment in Dubai. These are real life situations. These are tangible states that people are after. We can think about states as situations that people are in. They're in a current situation right now and they desire to be in a different situation, a better situation. If a business sells to individuals, we typically call this business to consumer, B2C. And if a business sells to other businesses, we can call this business to business, which is B2B. So now we know that what states are, we need to question how a business sells a state, right? People buying states, that's what people are buying in life. But how does a business actually sell a state? Well, if a state is an ideal situation and somebody isn't there right now, something is stopping them from achieving their desired state. And again, desired state, I mean their ideal emotions, their ideal lifestyle, the things that are tangible in the service. In the rawest sense of the word, businesses solve problems. That's what they're here to do and that's what they do. And businesses that solve problems well grow and businesses that aren't good at solving problems don't grow. We'll get onto that a little bit more later. People are currently in a current situation and they want to be in a desired situation, but something is stopping them from getting there. Otherwise, they would always already be in their desired situation and they wouldn't desire, it's in the word, they wouldn't desire a change. They wouldn't believe that there's a better future out there because they're already satisfied with their current situation or their current states. Now, when somebody is in a current situation and has a vision for a different desired situation, we call this a gap. There is a gap. The gap is between current situation or the current state to their desired situation or their desired state. Now, while businesses solve problems, they cannot solve everybody's problems all at once. This is just not 
not possible. There are too many problems in the world and too many problems that people face in life. So for a business to get clients, they need to help. They need to have people to help and something to sell them. And the, the thing that they're selling is the thing that solves the problem or helps them get from current state to desired state. It, it you know, jumps the gap. So a business would decide on who to help by determining a market that they would like to enter. A market otherwise referred to as a niche is a group of people or businesses that share common attributes. For example, the way they do business, i.e., you know, the businesses are dental practices and that's one market or one niche or home improvement businesses. And that's another market or another niche. They all share something in common and this is what makes them a niche ultimately. Now, technically speaking, a market would be dental clinics, whereas a niche would specifically be cosmetic dental clinics, if we were going by the actual definition. However, niche and market are used interchangeably in the agency space. So today you can consider them one and the same thing. It's just that generally speaking, market is more broad and niche is supposed to be more specific. But again, people use these words interchangeably. Ultimately, when it comes to the niche, the market, think about it as a group of people or a group of businesses. They have something in common, as I said before, maybe their business model is the same. They're both dental practices. They're both home improvement businesses. You could even potentially have a geographical niche and you just focus on that, that, that segment of the greater market of, of people and businesses in the world. Now, from here onwards, I'll be speaking strictly about B2B, businesses selling to other businesses. But it's important to understand that ultimately you are a person selling to another person. So where where you're looking, whether you're looking for B2B or B2C clients, there's very little difference from a client acquisition perspective. But by being a business owner, you are ultimately helping people grow their businesses. And by doing so, they will be achieving their desired states helping them make 100K a month, which is tangible, and helping them feel predictability in the growth of their business, which is an emotional state that people are buying. There are many ways that a business would go about deciding on a niche to serve. Ultimately, a smart business decision would be to help a group of people who have a painful enough problem that they want a solution to. Because remember, people buy solutions to problems that hold them back from their desired states. If there's no problem, people won't buy. If there's no desired situation, people won't buy. It has to be a gap. And if there's no clear solution that they believe will help them get to where they want to be, people won't buy. They must believe in the solution. But as mentioned before, businesses cannot solve everyone's problems. And this is where a niche comes in. A good niche, a quote unquote good niche is one that has a painful enough problem that you can create a solution to. To be successful with client acquisition, a business needs to be able to find the right people to contact within the niche. For example, if you contacted a sales assistant at Apple and you told them that you could increase Apple sales, they wouldn't be able to do anything, nor would they even care. You know, this is why we want to be able to, we want to make sure that we can easily find people within the businesses that can make those buying decisions and ultimately care about making those decisions and, and doing that thing. And we call these people decision makers. It's these people who have the vision to see a desired state that they're not currently in and acknowledge the gap. Usually it's the CEO, but sometimes depending on the size of the company, the CEO may have delegated the responsibilities of achieving the desired state to another person in the business. Either way, it's best practice to ensure that the niche that you pick makes it easy enough for you to contact the decision maker. The more difficult it is for you to contact a decision maker, the harder it is for you to offer the solution to them, the person in charge of solving the problem. Now, if a business does not pick a niche, it will struggle to create a direct solutions to the problems that people are facing. There are a multitude of different reasons to actually pick a niche, but the most important thing is that people buy solutions that they believe without a doubt are going to work. If there's a business that solves every problem under the sun to whoever wants the solutions, there'll be no focus. No focus on solving a single problem in one single market creates doubt on whether or not the business can actually solve that problem in the first place. Now, doubt is eliminated when a business has predictability in the way they go about solving the problem. So from a client acquisition perspective, people buy solutions they believe will quote unquote work i.e. eliminate problems and close the gap between the current and desired situation, also known as states. 
okay? Now, from a business infrastructure perspective, if you become really, really good at solving one particular problem for one particular market, it's easier to solve the problem for more people. You just copy and paste the solution that you've got to everybody else that has that same problem and then done. So if your goal is solving a problem, you wanna make it as easy as possible for you to do that. And if people are buying solutions to problems, naturally as a business, if that's what you're selling, yes, you would wanna make it as easy as possible. It's just logical. Now, this all comes from having a predictable system, which comes from having as few variables as possible. If you solve one problem for free, for free niches, it may seem that it's just three variables, you know, three different niches, but actually the ripple effect is huge when it comes to service delivery and client acquisition. And this is unnecessary operational complexity. It just doesn't make sense, especially if you're operating as a solo, solo individual or as a small team, just keep it simple. In the beginning, you can look at expanding, solving the same problem for multiple niches, but in the beginning, just keep it simple. One niche, one problem, and just go like that. Solve one problem for one market or one niche. And there's a there's this famous quote, simplicity scales, complexity fails. So how to actually pick a niche? Well, find a market that has a painful problem that people would pay a solution for. They would actually, they want a solution, they're willing to give you money for the solution. The easier it is to reach the decision makers, the more options you have when it comes to how you acquire clients. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. But you also want to ensure that there are thousands of businesses within the market. If a niche is too small, there are fewer people you can help. And so the harder your client acquisition and service delivery will be. The more people you have, the more businesses and people that you can reach out to. The best, excuse me, the best niches typically sell their products or services all year round and are growing markets. You know, we don't want to work with a business that's like dying off that nobody uses anymore. We want to work with businesses that have things that just sell, sell all year round and we can just continue working with them. Now, if you're interested in who you're helping, this will also make everything else easier. A lot of people say that you've got to be passionate about the niche you work with. I don't believe that passion is, is the right word to use, but you do have to be interested, right? And if you care about the people you're helping, yes, you're going to, you know, where it gets tough sometimes actually doing this agency thing, whether that's client acquisition, service delivery, or whatever it is, sometimes it will get a little bit tough. You will need to do things that you don't enjoy. If you're doing those things for people that you actually care about or for a niche that you care about, it's gonna be a lot easier. You're gonna be able to persevere and actually push through you know, a lot easier. So it does help to work in a niche that you actually enjoy. Now, the best way to pick a niche ultimately is to make a list of all the niches that you have personal experience with and then compare it to the list above these bullet points that I've got right here. If you find a match, go for it. And what I mean by this is literally just get us, get like a pen and paper or you know, get a Google Docs open and just write down all of the niches you have experience with. So previously for myself, my very first job ever when I was 16 was at McDonald's. <laughs> I was 16. After that, I worked in a home furnishing store. After that, I worked in a fashion store. And then after that, I worked in a tile store. So we sold tiles, how you know, wall and floor tiles. So I could make a list of all of those. And based on those, I mean, ultimately, we ended up scaling an e-commerce women's fashion brands, which is something that I had experience with from selling fashion previously. I could have gone into like tiling or home improvement, and I would have been able to talk their language because I knew that space very, very well. And then likewise, I could have gone in, you know, a home furnishing direction. But uh, I don't know many niches that I would potentially do in that side. But what I'm saying here is make a niche of all of the experience that you have, previous jobs that you've worked, skills that you have, experience that you have, work experience, different things, things that you know about, things that you're passionate about. If you go to the gym a lot, look into fitness. If you're really, you know, really into health, look into that direction. Look at what you have personal experience with and then compare it to the list here. And then if you find something that's a fit, then go for it. Now, on the flip side, if you just stepped out of a cave and have absolutely no life experience, then have a look at this list. I'll make sure I link it on the below to get some inspiration. So you can always have a look at this list here. Now, if you're still struggling, use the second list. The second list is much larger than the first, but ultimately you use these just to get inspiration so you can see what's really out there in terms of the niche, uh, the niches that are available. Now, I couldn't tell you what the best niche is because the best niche is the one that you have a solution for. And right now, it's probably zero niches unless you're a little bit more advanced than where we're at currently in this training, but we will get to you later. So look at this list and compare it with the checklist I gave you above and find a winning combination. Don't overthink it. If the niche matches the criteria and you wanna do it, go for it. You create the best niche. 
Because as long as the niche meets the objective criteria that I've given you, the best niche is subjective. It depends on if you're actually going to enjoy it, the solution that you've got, and ultimately, you know, you actually being in the niche and making it the best niche. You make it yourself. So while I cannot give you a best niche list, there are some thoughts on some difficult niches or quote unquote difficult niches. So online businesses, i.e. e-commerce, are very common for agencies to pick up due to their high earning potential and their high pain level. This said, e-commerce is notoriously difficult to actually contact the decision makers, book meetings with and get results for. Healthcare businesses are typically difficult to contact the decision maker. Why? Well, because they're constantly working people's health themselves and so they're difficult to reach. My very first niche that I targeted back in 2017 was working with dental practices. This was really tough because the dentists that I, the decision makers that I wanted to be reaching were the dentists themselves, like the head dentist or, or whatever. And for me to reach that person, I would have to call it the most obscure times where they, the, like the one minute in the day that they weren't literally working in somebody's mouth on their teeth. So it's not, not easy. So that's the, you want to keep those two things in mind. Now, with this considered, these niches can work. You just need to be the better marketer. The better and more creative you are at marketing, the easier it will become to actually overcome these concerns. And this training today, by the way, is, is going to help you. If you did want to go for these niches, you would still be able to, as long as you've got the right principles and you know what it is that you're doing. Now, niches themselves cannot be saturated. This isn't a thing. Instead, think about the markets as being crowded. The more crowded the markets are or the niches are, the louder your messaging or your marketing needs to be in order to stand out and capture their attention. And yes, there will be more on this later. So once you have a niche, we want to dig a little deeper. Think about it. Let's say that you chose to work with home improvement businesses. Does that mean that you want to work with the plumber who started his first business yesterday and also the roofer who's been in the industry for 50 years? Well, probably not. Why? Well, the plumber who started yesterday is probably broke and your offer is likely not going to be actually suited for this person. Whereas the people in 50 years, it's just they're in completely different places in their business journey. And this is where we consider what's called an ICP, which is an ideal customer profile. Now, within a niche, we want to define a smaller segment of people that you can help. Helping the plumber get his first client and the roofer get their 10,000th ,000, 10, are two entirely different challenges. For example, the plumber just wants to prove to himself that he can do this. Whereas the massive roofing company already has clients coming in and they want a different problem solved. Just because you help quote unquote home improvement businesses, that doesn't mean you can help everyone within that niche. Not everyone will have the problems you solve, nor will they be looking for your solution. Defining your ICP might become a little bit easier once you have an idea of what you're going to sell to the niche. So in order for you to know what to sell to the niche and what segment of the, mar of the niche you actually want to help, you need to conduct some market research. Now, let me be totally honest with you here because market research is not something that many beginners enjoy. You know, they, don't, they don't typically enjoy this stage. If you chose a niche that you're passionate about, then maybe it will be a little bit easier. But typically speaking, you know, a lot of business owners, especially in the agency space, just want to sign clients, make money so they go ahead and they can move to Bali or Dubai. But remember, people buy solutions that they believe will predictably and without a doubt solve their problems. So if you've been in business for a while, you know that market research is the most important thing you will ever do in business. It's the most important thing that you will ever do in business. If you build a business with a foundation made of sand, it could collapse at any moment and will not be strong enough to hold the weight of the journey that you are embarking on. By conducting sufficient market research, you'll be able to find the specific problems painful problems that people want solutions to and you will know them better than they know themselves and the better that you know your audience the better and easier client acquisition will be because business isn't about you it's about the people you're serving now thankfully market research isn't very difficult it just takes a, a little bit of commitment and focus so what are you looking for you're looking for, to identify the most painful problems that your niche face Identify the segment of your niche that most commonly faces this problem. This will be your ICP. You want to understand the effects the problem has on the niche and understand the current and desired situations of individuals that face this particular problem. And by doing the above, you will have identified the problems that you should be solving, the ICP that you should be targeting, why people want to solve this problem, and what people will get from solving this problem, i.e. their desired 
situ um, the desired situation or their desired states. Now, by finding the problems, you find solutions. By finding an ICP, you know who to look for and who to target. By knowing why people want to solve the problem and the effects they will achieve, you will know how to market your solution to the ICP. The more you know your audience, the better your solution and your marketing will be for them. So what is marketing? Well, marketing is part of the client acquisition process. Think about it as a way of finding your identified ICP and making them aware of, the, of your solution that you have to the problems that they could be facing. Now remember, your ICP has the problems you solve. If somebody doesn't have the problems you solve, then they will not buy your solution. And quite frankly, they're not your ICP anyway. The role your marketing plays is to help you locate those people that do match your ICP and let them know about the solution that you have for them. Now, I keep talking about the word solution. It's time to introduce exactly how that would look for the business and client. Think about solution as something you're offering somebody. And in this space, we call this an offer. And the way that I perfect, personally define an offer is a transformation that you are offering somebody. And the reason for that is, well, ultimately, we are offering a process that is going to help somebody close the gap between their current and desired state or situation. By doing so, we're offering them a transformation in both emotional and tangible states. The offer you sell to somebody is a vehicle to get them from A to B. You have A, you have B. You have current situation and state, and you have desired situ situation or state. It's about getting, you know, closing that gap and getting them from A to B. Now, your objective in creating an offer is to create a predictable and repeatable process that you can follow to solve problems for your clients. In order to create an offer, you need to know the biggest problem that your market is facing and that you can solve, and then secondly, how to actually solve that problem. Now, not all problems are problems that you'll be able to or want to be focused on solving. Now, by definition, my, my audience of social media marketing agency owners solves marketing related problems. But businesses don't just have marketing problems. They have delivery problems, you know, service delivery, like actual logistical delivery problems, financial problems, etc. Now, marketing in many ways is the lifeblood of a business. And this is where the high level of social media marketing agencies come from. But ultimately, we're just service based businesses that solve problems for other businesses. This means that in theory, if you're an agency owner, you could actually solve other problems if you decided to. You could help your market save money on taxes or lower their product development costs, for example. Obviously, in that case, you wouldn't be a marketing agency, but you would still be a service-based business, which you could definitely do. So typically, marketing-based offers are recommended because without good marketing, businesses struggle to acquire customers. No customers equals, quote-unquote, no business. With this, marketing and client acquisition is typically the most valuable and painful problem for most businesses. They need it to grow and to make money. The more painful the problem is, the more that we can charge to solve the problem. Marketing is very painful and worth a lot to the right businesses. And also, the barrier to entry is relatively low. Marketing problems can generally be easier to solve than other problems. You know, like Facebook advertising, for example, it's not very difficult. We'll get onto that a little bit later. So with market research you conduct, we're ideally looking for a problem that marketing can solve. Typically, marketing is used to generate leads and schedule appointments. Now, a lead is someone whose contact details you have access to. In terms of helping other businesses, by generating leads for them, you're helping them find people or to whom they can promote their own offer. So whether the business is selling services or products, the core of what they're selling remains the same. You know, people buy teeth whitening, which is a service, to feel more confident, which is emotional, and to achieve a brighter smile, which is tangible. People pay for an iPhone, which is a product, to feel more prestigious and trendy, which is emotional, and to contact their friends, which is the tangible aspect, or watch videos like this. Either way, the business is selling states. So as you may have realized from these examples, people typically buy with their emotions and they justify with logic, but we'll come back to this later when we're talking about sales. So back to offer creation. Now, we know that people have a current and desired state. There is a gap between these and this is a painful problem for them. And people buy solutions to remove the painful problem they're facing. Now, the problem itself could be simply be the fact that they're not yet at their desired state already or a problem that's directly in the way of being at their ideal state. What I mean by that is simply not being there creates pain. 
you know, you currently making 5k a month, wanting to make 50k a month, there is an element of pain there. But if there's a specific reason that you're not yet at 50k, like for example, your lead flow is poor, then that's another specific problem. There's actually two problems. Problem one is that you're not yet there and that creates pain. Problem two is a specific problem that's creating that gap in the first place. If we're, if our offer can solve both, you know, we're, we're winning. So once you know what their problem is, you can create a predictable solution and this is your offer. All right, so the service delivery side is out of the scope of this training, but think about it like this. If their main problem is generating leads, you need to sell a predictable solution that generates leads. If their main problem is generating appointments, then you need to sell a predictable solution that generates appointments. And if their main problem is quote unquote generating customers or clients, you'll potentially need to sell a predictable solution that solves the lead generation issue, the appointment generation issue, and the sales problem all free. Now, as a little side note, where many agencies go wrong is that they're telling the market that they can solve their appointment generation problem. Now, as for a quick side note, where many agencies go wrong is they're telling the market they can solve their appointment generation problem, but their process actually can only predictably generate leads. Understand that a lead is not an appointment. An appointment is not a sale. Often businesses misdiagnose their problems. They would say, you know, we have a lead generation problem, where in actuality, they have enough leads. Their real problem is what they're doing with the leads in the first place. Now, this by the way, is a real world example. Most businesses do have leads that they can contact. They just don't know how to get the lead to progress to the next stage of the client acquisition process. And to break down the client acquisition process, we have lead generation, lead nurture, and lead conversion. This is really what client acquisition is at a, at a high level, lead generation, lead nurture, and lead conversion. Now, lead generation is generating the contact information of potential customers, people in your ICP, that you have their contact information to and you could market your offer to them. Lead nurture is marketing the offer to the lead, increasing their interest in the offer. In some niches, the lead nurture is essentially appointment booking. It's getting people to book in a sales appointment with you as it is for, for agencies. Now for a lead conversion, this is the process of selling the product or the offer and exchanging our offer with the lead's money. And this is what makes them a customer. Remember, a customer has to be somebody that, that buys from the business. Now in marketing, we use a temperature system of cold, warm, and hot to communicate how close the lead is to pur purchasing the offer. So for example, if somebody has no idea or just recently found out about the business, they are cold. If they're familiar with the business and what, what the business does, the offer, etc., they're warm. And if somebody has shown interest that they're ready to buy, or if they're already a customer, then typically they're hot. This hot, cold, and warm thing, uh, sorry, this hot, hot, warm, and <laughs> hot, this cold, warm, and hot thing is a skill. And a lead is either cold, warmer, or hot. You need to ensure that your offer solves the specific problem that your market is facing. If you simply generate leads for a business, they might not yet have a nurturer system in place to warm up the leads. Ice cold leads don't buy. Once you know the specific problem your market is facing, you create an offer to actually help them solve a problem. And as for another side note here, while I am saying that most businesses have a lead nurture problem, not a lead generation problem, it's typically important for the agency owner to help with both of, both of these. If the business already has a consistent and predictable flow of leads, having a lead, having only a lead nurture process is okay and you can offer that and there'll be a lot of value there. But the reason for this is that the client acquisition system is a process, it's a whole system. Each step of the client acquisition requires the previous step to be working in order to maximize results. If there are no leads, the lead nurture process cannot function. If it's not functioning, then there's nobody there to buy. Now, again, it's lead generation, lead flow, and then lead conversion. So if the business doesn't have lead flow, we need to fix that first, and then their lead nurture. Typically, agency offers stop here. They get the lead for the client and they get the lead maybe even to schedule an appointment, but then they leave their sales part to the client. The problem with this is that many of the businesses you'll be working with suck at sales and marketing 
Hence, this is why they outsourced it to you instead. So if they suck at marketing and sales, what do you think is going to happen when you generate them warm leads, people that are pretty much ready to buy? Well, their lead conversion will suck. They don't have sales. So what does this mean? The more of your client acquisition process you can control, the better your solution will work and the better results your clients will see. The better results you get, the more valuable your offer is. Quick side note, what I mean by this is pin out the client acquisition process like I've done for you today, where it's lead generation, lead nurture, lead conversion, pin out what that looks like for your niche or your, your niche or your ICP specifically, and then consider, okay, what's the furthest point that I can help them with? The farther you can go down and the more that you could like, if you could literally guarantee that people would just make money, just make money, then they will, you know, always go for it. But a lot of agencies, as I said, they're, they're only generating leads where they're generating leads in the appointment, but they're not making sure the person actually shows up to the appointment. And they're not actually giving them sales training. So people don't actually know what to do when it comes to sales. So you've got to get very, very clear on that. Um, and again, just the further that you can get down that process to a certain extent, the better. And again, we'll, we'll dive into this even a little bit more later. So speaking about value, I mentioned earlier that the more painful the problem is, the more we can charge to solve the problem. And here's what I mean by that. When it comes to pricing the offer, think about this as an exchange of value. Now, money itself is only quote unquote valuable because it has a form of a value attached to it. We all know the value of one dollar or one pound for English people like myself. But people will give you their one dollar if you can give them something that has more value than that one dollar. If what you're offering isn't worth more than the price you're charging, or if the value is perceived to be lower than the value of the money itself, people won't buy. So the more painful the problem you solve, the more value there is attached to your solution. And so the more money you can charge people to access your solution. Likewise, the more results you help your clients achieve, the more valuable your solution is. It's simple, simple economics. If your offer is higher value than the money you charge, people will buy. To summarize where we're at so far, you've picked a niche, you've identi identified a segment of the market to help, and we call these people your ICP, your ideal customer profile. And with using market research, you know the problems they're facing, and you've created an offer to solve the problems. The offer itself from a position of creating a solution is out of the scope of this training, as it's more service delivery related. But I will mention this, an offer is the transformation you're offering somebody. In order to, ch to achieve this transformation, you have a process to follow. The process itself is a mechanism that makes the transformation possible. Now with this in mind, if your offer is that you help businesses generate leads, you'll be using a mechanism to help you with that. An example of a lead generation lead generation mechanism is paid advertising and depending on your approach paid advertising itself either generates leads with a lead form or just generates traffic to a landing page which will then capture the lead if the agency is only running ads to a lead landing page they don't control you could say that they're only generating traffic but ultimately the lead is only generated as long as somebody hands over their contact details without the contact details they are just traffic and traffic is the lowest value that you can provide a client. And directly helping them get customers is among the highest value levels. Take a look at the big picture and you will see what I mean. We've got traffic and traffic turns into leads. Leads turn into appointments, appointments turns into sales. When you have a customer, that's a customer now. They've, they've bought at sales, they're a customer. Now we look at you know retaining, retain, uh, retaining them, retaining that customer. And then we're looking at how can we make more money from them? And that there is customer value maximization. So ultimately, this entire process, traffic, leads, appointments, sales, retention, customer value maxi maximization, maximization rather, that's, the, that's kind of the entire flow here, a, a larger high level view. So as I mentioned before, the more value you provide, the higher you can charge. That said, if your goal, your goal should be to become really good at solving a valuable problem. Now, don't help them with everything that I just mentioned up here. Just get really, really good at something. Just get, get really good at something, the main bottleneck that prevents everyone else from functioning properly and your offer will be ridiculously valuable. So what I mean by that is find out what is the number one bottleneck, the number one problem that people are facing and focus on, on solving that one. That's where it will be valuable. 
Because if you fix one thing that's creating all of the problems that come later, you, you find out what is the foundationary problem that's causing all of this trauma, all of these problems, and you fix that one thing, then the rest opens up. Now, a bottleneck is a blockage somewhere in the system. If the business's bottleneck is their appointment booking uh, approach, then by solving that problem, you have either fixed their entire business or you'll kind of inadvertently be creating a new problem. Now, this is where upsells come into it. Once you fix one problem, you can fix another that has been created by your and the original solutions. So for example, you help them generate leads and book appointments, and then you coach them on sales. Those three areas are instantly solved. You could now, in theory, upsell them to a retention offer or offer an offer or, or an offer targeted at helping them make more money without getting more customers. So, you know, uh, customer value maximization here. But again, simplicity scales. If you're just starting out, stick to one main thing and become very, very good at it. Now, by this point, you are probably already away ahead of agency owners out there. You have a thorough understanding of a niche and ICP offers, marketing, and much more. So what about you actually selling your offer? Like, what does that look like, practically speaking? Well, as you know, there are three main areas to focus on here. There's lead generation, lead nurture, and lead conversion. So let's go through these one by one from a practical standpoint of how you can fix these three areas of your own agency. Lead generation, again, means generating the contact information of potential customers or clients. By the way, customers, clients is a word that's, again, used interchangeably. They mean the same thing. So if your market and your offer is the foundation of client acquisition system, your lead generation is the actual start point of the client acquisition system itself. Think about a system as a process or a set of processes that produce a predictable result. Your client acquisition system generates leads, warms up your leads to have them schedule a sales call, and then you sell your offer to the prospect on the sales call. Now, a prospect or prospective buyer is somebody who has been warmed up through your lead nurturing process and now are closer to buying your offer. Remember that the temperature thing is a skill. Colder, cold, warm, warmer, hot, hotter. Traffic is ice cold, a lead is cold, a prospect is warm, and a customer is scorching hot. All systems require inputs, a process or processes, and outputs. The inputs of a client acquisition system is leads. You put leads in. The process is the lead nurturing and lead conversion process. And the end result, hopefully, is clients. But sometimes it's not that simple. A system itself always, quote unquote, works, but that doesn't mean that it produces the results that you're after. Whether it works or produces the results you're after, those are two entirely different things. A system itself always works. If you have leads that don't have a nurturing process to warm them up, i.e. get them to schedule a sales call, you won't have anyone to pitch your offer to in the first place on a sales call. Now, systems also have an environment that they're in and they, and they also produce feedback for us. So for example, if you have a good process of lead generation and a way of processing uh, and a way or process of nurturing your leads, but the sales conversion process isn't performing like you want it to, this gives us feedback that the system needs tightening up, that there's a quote unquote bottleneck at some point. In this scenario, the lead conversion system of the greater client acquisition system is the bottleneck. That's the part. The lead conversion is not booking you meetings, and that's the bottleneck. If you get that fixed, you'll have more meetings. By getting more meetings, you will have more customers or clients. So if you solve the lead conversion bottleneck, you'll be making much more money. But the quality of your outputs is entirely dependent on the quality of your inputs. If you put poor, if you put quality leads into an amazing system, you will have a money counter that won't stop running. If you put poor quality leads into an amazing system, you'll struggle to pay rent. Now, why? Well, firstly, by quote unquote poor quality, this could mean anything from people that are broke and that just don't have money or those that don't have a problem that you can solve, people outside your niche or something else. But in short, by quote unquote poor quality leads, I'm referring to people who could not buy your offer if they were pitched to. Somebody who could buy, at, buy but at the end of your sales call give you an objection is not a poor quality lead. You just have a problem in, in objection handling. Objection handling would be your bottleneck. Now, if they cannot buy, 
they are quote unquote poor quality. Now understand that I'm not referring to these individuals as poor quality people. There's a very, very big, big difference. This is simply from the standpoint of systems thinking, right? We're being very, very objective right now. And we're looking at the system. We're not looking at the individual person and their own attributes. We're looking at the system as a whole. So if somebody could not afford your offer, please don't judge them as individuals. Just understand that right now, you and they are not a fit to work together. Likewise, just because somebody doesn't have the budget or problem right now, this does not mean that they still won't in the future. Both money and problems come and go. The feedback produced by the system helps you find the bottlenecks you need to focus on the fixing. So quick recap, you've got a system, a system needs inputs. There's an input and there's a process and then there are outputs that come out. In addition to the outputs, you also get feedback. You're able to see, you know, what is working. If, you know, if you've got enough leads coming in, but you don't have enough sales at the end, then you need to look at what's the step before. Either you have an issue with your sales process, which is your lead conversion process, or you have a process with your appointment booking process, which is the bit in the middle, which is actually, you know, booking appointments with people, your lead nurturing. And then ultimately with whatever is happening, you're getting feedback and you're using the feedback to, to bring you back into to the beginning so you can improve the system at some point. You can find out exactly what's broken, what's not working the way that it should be, and then you can fix that very specific part, okay? So again, the feedback produced by the system helps you find the bottlenecks that you need to focus on fixing. If you get the feedback, or we can call it data, you get feedback of your data coming out, then you're able to see, okay, what needs changing? You can go ahead, you can make those changes, make those improvements, and ultimately, improve the performance of your system. Now, the environment that your client acquisition system is in includes things like your niche, your business model, and more. Now, the, experience, the environment itself is not part of the system, but it does impact the performance of your system. For example, the approach you take when doing client acquisition to lawyers is different than you would take if you were targeting fashion brand owners, for example. You'd likely want to be more professional around lawyers that you, than you would be with creative people who own fashion brands. And if you followed this step so far, lead generation itself shouldn't be very difficult. You've identified your niche, your ICP, and now it's your job to go out and actually find these people in the first place. In terms of doing this, your ICP now forms a criteria that you'll be looking for in leads. When you go out to find leads, you're looking for this particular criteria or this ICP. And thankfully, there are various databases that you can use to find the leads that match your criteria, your ICP. My favorite is Apollo.io, which you can create a free account with and search for your criteria. For example, if you're targeting home improvement businesses that specialize in roofing and have been around for five to 10 years, you can find this in Apollo. You know, you can use filters to look for businesses in your ideal geographical locations, search by company headcount, look for the decision makers such as the CEO, and much more. Apollo.io is a great source of finding leads, but their quality of data sometimes isn't quite the best. It could be better. So while we use Apollo.io to find the leads themselves, we generally use find email to find the email addresses that we can contact. And remember, a lead is somebody of whom you have contact details for. By the way, any tools or software that I mentioned today, I'll make sure I leave the link down below and you can just easily access you know, everything else that I'm talking about here. Okay. Now, contact details could be anything from email addresses, phone numbers, a LinkedIn profile, an Instagram profile, or anything else that is personal to the individual that you're targeting, i.e. not the business itself, but the individual. So remember, we want to reach the people that would be able to make a buying decision, which ultimately is the decision maker. So we use find email to find email addresses. But if you wanted to reach out to people on LinkedIn, you could just find their LinkedIn profile instead. For the lead generation side of your system, the goal should be to have a predictable process of finding contact information for people that could buy your offer. Focus on generating leads that match your ICP or your ideal criteria. Now, the second method that you can go to actually generate leads is delegation. And this means hiring somebody to find leads for you. Using Upwork, you can typically buy leads from people that we call data miners from anywhere from 10 cents to 30 cents per lead USD. Now you could also use Fiverr. However, Upwork has generally produced better quality leads for us. Ultimately, this method, you just go to Upwork, you post the job post, you say, hey, I need somebody to give, you, give me some leads that match this criteria. You tell them how many leads you want, you negotiate a the price, they do the work, you get the leads, 
you get to go. All right, that's delegation. Now the third method of lead generation should only be reserved for people who really don't have any money whatsoever to invest in the growth of their business. And for those people, the third method is just manual lead generation. To do this, you can use Google Maps, Instagram search, Instagram hashtags, free LinkedIn search, and so on these ways to find leads. Now, I personally don't recommend that you do this unless you absolutely don't have the money because it's just not the most efficient use of your time. And also it's virtually impossible to identify whether or not leads meet your criteria when you use this manual approach. But there is one method of manual lead generation that is actually worth doing for everybody. Um, and this is finding paid online communities that have your ICP. Now this could be a paid course, paid online programs, online eBooks that come with communities or so on. Just something online where you can find people. Communities is what you're after. Now, people who pay any amount of money to solve a problem are generally more in pain than anyone else or at least more serious about solving that problem. So if you can find online communities with people that have actually, that you know are actively buying solutions to their problems, no matter what the price point is, naturally they will be much higher quality leads. And honestly, lead generation for agencies is not particular, particularly tough, but it is important. And it's important to get this right because remember, with poor inputs or leads, your client acquisition system will not perform well. The last thing to mention when it comes to lead generation is the quality of data. You could have a good lead, but if you have an email address for them that doesn't work, you won't be able to actually contact them in the first place. And this is why it's important to ensure you're using the best sources of data. You know, Apollo.io and Find Email generally produce pretty good quality data. If you're using another tool to find email addresses, just make sure that you verify the email addresses using Neverbounce to ensure that you are capturing working email addresses. We, we don't want to send emails to email addresses that don't work. It's, it's not good for the accounts that we're using and it affects deliverability, which is uh, slightly out of the scope of this video, but it's very, very important that, um, that you're emailing people that, that exist and that the email addresses actually work. And by footering the steps above that I just went through for lead generation, you will have leads to reach out to. Now, once you have leads, you need a process of actually booking appointments with them. And this is the lead nurturing seg section of your client acquisition system. The main goal of lead nurturing is to book sales appointments with people who could buy your offer, i.e. we're looking for people who match your ICP, including the fact that they have the problem you can solve and money to pay for the solution. The mistake that many agencies make in this phase is they think that booking a meeting with anyone in their niche is a good idea. But now, by now, you should understand that not all sales appointments are equal. Some appointments are with higher quality prospects than others. And as you know, the higher the lead quality, the higher the likelihood that they will actually purchase your offer. So quality itself is about how likely they are to purchase your solution. People who are of higher quality have a high, much higher chance of actually converting into paying clients. And that's how we determine you know, quality or qualification. So, if the lead generation stage has, generate, has generated us qualified leads, and now it's all about booking appointments with them, and we know that the warmer someone is, the more likelihood they will they are to schedule and buy, then that naturally means that lead generation is the process of warming up our leads and getting them to book appointments. Now, to do this, there are various, various methods we can go about it. To keep this simple, the three most common methods are cold calling, cold emailing, and cold social media outreach. They all say the word cold because the process is directly targeting or contacting leads that are cold and essentially offering your solution to them. Remember, cold being people that don't know who we are and they probably never heard of us before, or at least not to our knowledge. Now, there are warm approaches to lead nurturing, and this can include email lists, social media content, and social media outreach. Social media outreach in this context, I'm talking about people who are following you and engaging with your content and you can reach out to them. And this is more warm, whereas cold social media is reaching out to people who have no idea who you are. They don't follow you. They don't engage with your content. Just going completely cold to them and just saying, hey, what's up? My name is Reese. This is what we do, right? So what makes this warm, these free email lists, social media content, social media outreach, what it makes it warm is that these people already know who you are. 
Some methods could be both warm and cold. And then it just depends on the temperature of the lead and prospect. So for example, if today is the first time that you've ever seen my content or heard my name, then you were at the beginning of this training, ice cold. Throughout this training, you've become more familiar with me and so have become much warmer to the point where you may consider clicking below this video, video uh, and booking a call with me to see if and how I can help you solve your client acquisition process entirely. If you're already familiar with me before, now you're much warmer and the likelihood of you seeing if I can actually help you solve your client acquisition problem becomes stronger and stronger with each section second you continue watching this video. And that in essence is exactly what lead nurturing is. It's taking somebody that's cold and warming them up, warming up somebody by having them see, feel and believe that you can help them solve the biggest problem that they face and that your offer say, solves. Now the lead nurturing process itself is everything from reaching out to the lead for the first time, warming them up and having them schedule a sales call and ensuring that they show up to the call. There could be bottlenecks in each parts, each of these parts of the process. By now you've seen me use the term outreach, which essentially means that you're reaching out to somebody. Outreach is the process of reaching out to somebody. The amount of times you do this could be called outreaches. So for example, if you send 10 cold emails and 10 cold calls, you've done 10, you've done 20 outreaches in total, 10 for each platform or method. So generally speaking, the more outreaches you do, the higher your chance of finding the people that are qualified to purchase your offer. With this said, you must accept and appreciate that a portion of your leads will not be interested in your offer. In fact, it's helpful to appreciate that as high as 50% of your leads will never purchase your offer. Maybe they don't have the problem you solve, maybe they won't have the finances, or maybe they just don't like you. Whatever the reason, understand it, accept it. Don't be mad if you're not booking calls with all 100 leads that you have. It just, it's not gonna happen. Don't expect it. Just be cool with understanding that you're not gonna get 100% success rate in, in anything in life, including and specifically when it comes to this. So if your sole focus is booking appointments, at least 50% of those people you're reaching out to wouldn't buy anyway. Depending on how you perceive sales, you might call this a quote unquote waste of time. I prefer to just acknowledge that it's part of the game and understand that my job is booking meetings with qualified people. If I had two people book in, schedule in for the same time slot, one was ice cold from an ad that they've just seen and the other was warm and then I've been speaking to that person for months, I would take the second appointment, the appointment of the second prospect, because this person is more likely to purchase. And so is a much better and more efficient use of my time to be totally transparent. But still, it's important that you value, value all leads and prospects because you never know who is part of the 50% that would buy and the 50% that would never buy. In fact, in most cases, it's nearly impossible to identify which is which. And due to this, treat everybody with respect unless they disrespect you and you determine that they're part of the 50% because you wouldn't want to work with disrespect, but disrespectful people. Now, let me just quickly add a little note to that. What I'm saying is don't start getting disrespectful to people if they're rude to you. The best thing to do, if somebody is showing that they're part of the 50% of people that you simply don't want to work with because you don't work with disrespectful people, there's no need for you to respond to them. You just move on to the next lead or the next prospect. You don't need to continue talking with them, okay? So don't, yeah, I when I was like 17 and I was getting people to say they're not interested, I was taking that personally, you know, and if people were like, Hey, you're, you're, I was 17 and people were like, you're terrible at business. I was taking that deep to my chest, you know, so I would respond back to those people. Uh, don't do that. Not a smart idea. Just move on. Be better than I was. Now with this in mind, understand that just because somebody doesn't book a sales call right away, that doesn't mean that they never will. Right. They might just need a few months first before they book in. You never know quite how warm or cold somebody is, but with experience, you'll become better at gauging who is warmer than somebody else. So if your main goal is to schedule qualified appointments and to do this, you need to outreach to people, then how do we actually get them to book in? Well, capturing their, in their interest is the first place to start. In the simplest form and the simplest way to explain this, the way to do this is just reaching out to a lead and stating either the problem you solve or the solution you have. You've likely seen people say, you know, we help niche achieve desired outcome with mechanism. For example, we help agency owners scale to 15 to 30K a month with proven and predictable client acquisition systems. 
if I sent an email with this messaging to, in to dentists, that wouldn't capture their interest in the slightest. If I sent it to agency owners who were doing over 100K a month, maybe I also barely capture their interest, but not really, not a lot, you know, because I'm only saying we add 15 to 30K. Somebody that's doing 100K, it's not really going to like, they're not going to be too interested by that. Now, in fact, using this type of messaging, I'm only really targeting people who are doing less than around 30K a month with their agency. Now, I am aware of this and there are consequences that do come with it. You know, a portion of the calls that we book, although a small portion, are with 15-year-olds who have no money to invest. Now, ultimately, this free content that you're watching right now is for the people who aren't yet ready or available to buy our main offer. So the content is there to quote-unquote warm them up and just help them in the meantime. But ultimately, the point is that your messaging, that the messaging you use in your outreach either will or won't capture the attention of your audience. Once you have their attention, the most common thing is getting them to respond so you can actually find those that are somewhat interested. Now, we call this a CTA or a call to action, which would look something like, if this is something you're interested in, respond interested and I'll show you how this works. Or I might say, if, if you're interested in, in whatever else, click the link down below and, you know, have a look or whatever. But that's that's that would be another call to action is getting somebody to do something. Hey, do this thing. Subscribe. Hit the like button. Comment below. Uh, respond back to this message. Send me a thumbs up. Send me back a picture. Like whatever it is, it's a call to action. OK, now with a call to action, if they respond saying interested and I'll know that this is now somebody who might be uh, a qualified lead. Right. From here, I might invite them to a sales call with me so I can see if we can actually help them, which is the qualification side. And then what that would look like for that specific situation. Now, just like how not everyone you reach out to will be interested, not all the people who schedule and attend a sales school will be able to buy. And considering this, you only want to pitch people who are actually a fit. And by that, I mean qualified in the first place. We identify if they're a fit by speaking with them on a sales call, but we'll come back to the sales call later. Now, putting the outreach together so far, we have we help agency owners scale to 15 to 40K a month with proven and predictable acquisition systems. Is this something you're interested in? If this is something you're interested in, respond interested, and I'll show you how this works. Right? This is a solid start. It could be much better. How? Well, we can add some personalization in it to make the outreach feel more personal and genuine to the people that we're reaching out to. For example, we could say, hey, Alex, love the insight you shared on the Facebook ads case study where you produced 50K monthly recurring revenue for your client. Awesome results, by the way. And we could also potentially add in a case study. Right now, we're using the same system to generate 50 to 70 calls a month each month ourselves. And we've helped 55 other agency owners do the same thing. And then lastly, we'd sign off the outreach with, you know, regards, race, or something like that. So when we put this all together, the way it would look is you would say, hey, Alex, love the insights that you shared on the Facebook ad case study where you produce 50K monthly recurring revenue for your client. Awesome results, by the way. We help agency owners scale to 15 to 30K a month with proven and predictable client acquisition systems. Right now, we're using the same system to generate 50 to 70 calls each month ourselves. And we've helped over 55 plus other agencies do the same thing. If this is something you're interested in, respond to interested and I'll show you how it works. Really, really simple. Um, but that there is a pretty well written outreach message. And with a, free, a few tweaks to ensure that it actually flows a little better, it would be complete and ready to go. Now, using this for code outreach, we would go out, we would send it to around 300 people. And if the feedback we get says that the system is performing well and at the level that we wanted it to, then we would continue scaling and potentially even test something new. And when it comes to testing, we're monitoring the feedback received from the system in the form of metrics, and we're comparing the metrics to our goals. And the goals, we call it KPI, which stands for Key Performance Indicators. So if the outreach is performing and producing our goals, it's hitting the right targets, if it's performing at KPI, and it's working at the level that we expect, if the outreach is not producing our intended goals, then we would just continue making adjustments to find the women combination. And this is kind of just like a slot machine. One of the very, if, if all of the variables align, then we hit the jackpot. But if not, then we need to keep tweaking until we figure out, you know, what works. Now, if we have a good lead and the lead and the leads open the outreach, but they don't respond, so our outreach messages and they don't respond, then we know that the issue isn't 
And we know that the issue is that our marketing isn't appealing enough to get them to respond. And we just need them to re respond so we can offer a call and get them to schedule an appointment. And remember, we're looking for qualified appointments, not just appointments with everybody. Now, not everyone is going to respond to your initial outreach. Even those that do respond and say they're interested might disappear when you respond to their response. This is not something that you should take personally. If you know that your job is to identify leads that match your ideal criteria, then this should be your number one focus. So if somebody doesn't respond, follow up, which means to continue contacting them until they do. Not like a stalker, don't show up at their house, but like somebody who has, but like someone who has someone, something that could genuinely change their life with a solution. You believe that what you have could genuinely change their life and solve their biggest problem, and you just wanna give that to them. You wanna give them an opportunity to take it. So you're going to follow up with them until you get a yes or a no. Now, silence is not an answer. But we need answers for feedback. Silence is a form of feedback, but there are so many reasons for silence that we cannot rely on it. So, for example, what if they were interested, but when they opened your outreach immediately, they stubbed, the toe, stubbed their toe on the desk and forgot to get back to you? Well, don't make assumptions when it comes to client acquisition in general. Get confirmations. So considering follow ups can go on for a long time it's a good idea to track the leads that you know are quote unquote engaged. Engaged meaning that they've shown some level of interest in your offer at some time. This means if somebody responds to your email saying, once saying, I'm interested but busy right now, let's follow up in two months, then you need a way to track these prospects so you can check back in with them later. And quick side note, I've, I've recently spoke, you know, I speak with people that I spoke to first like a year ago. And like a year ago, was the very first time that I ever offered them a call. And then like this year, like now, literally a whole 12 months later, now we're actually having a call. And now potentially they're, they're actually gonna, you know, buy the offer because it's still relevant to their situation. So the point is, it's like you, just because somebody doesn't buy right away, don't think that doesn't mean they're not buying. Like they might at some point, you just continue following up, can continue. The way I like to see it is just continuing giving somebody an opportunity for them to change their lives you've got that something that will help them, you're just giving them more than one opportunity for them to take action on the thing, okay? So tracking prospects. Now, the way that we do this is we use what's called a CRM. The most efficient way to use a CRM is only tracking engaged leads, only tracking with people that you know at some level or another are interested in what you have to offer. Now, you can use a simple CRM, such as using Google Sheets, you can use Trello, you can use Airtable, or you can use a tool such as Go High Level. Now, we ourselves use a combination between Air, of Air, Airtable and Go High Level. However, I'd recommend that you just use Go High Level because it's the most efficient tool on the market. It's very simple to use, has a multitude of different tools, including the CRM, email, SMS, phone calling capabilities, a website builder, and a scheduler. Now, a scheduler is a link that you send people to have them book directly onto your calendar. Using scheduler links is the most convenient way to schedule appointments, and prevents you needing to go back and forth with the prospect to find a time. Once they want to schedule a call with you, you just send the scheduler over you, that you created with Go High Level, and they can schedule a slot on the calendar that works for you and them, because it literally syncs up with the calendar that you're using. Now, ensure that when you're doing this, ensure that you send a confirmation email or an SMS and a couple of reminders, so your prospects don't forget to show up for the call. The colder the prospect, the more follow-ups they need to ensure that they show up to the sales call. Now, lastly, I've spoken about system feedback a few times, ensuring that you are tracking necessary metrics so you can determine how well your client acquisition system is performing. So if you do cold email at a high level, the, thing, the metrics you might want to track include number of emails sent, bounce rate, which is the percentage of leads that the email was not delivered to, open rates, response rates, calendar link sent rate, so the, the number of times that you've actually sent a calendar link to somebody, the meeting book rate, the percentage or number of times that people have actually booked in a meeting, and the show up rate, so how many people show up compared to the people that book in, because again, not everybody that books is gonna show up. The pitch rate, so this is how many people on your sales call you actually end up pitching because they're qualified. Your sales conversion rate, which is the percentage of live calls that purchase. By live calls, I mean show ups, so people that show up and then purchase. Also, your number of sales and your total revenue generated. So that would be it for, for cold email. Now, for cold calling at a high level, you want to track number of dials made, 
pickup rate, pitches rate, meeting book rate, sharp rate, pitch rate, sales conversion rate, number of sales, total revenue generated. And then for cold social media messaging at a high level, you want to track number of messages sent, response rate, calendar link sent rate, meeting book rate, show up rate, pitch rate, sales conversion rate, number of sales, and total revenue generated. Now, by tracking these metrics, you will have found, uh, you'll be able to actually set goals for each metric, which is your KPIs, and then you'll be able to find and identify the bottlenecks based on the feedback that you're receiving. Now, as I mentioned earlier, remove the bottlenecks by testing different variables to fix that section of the system. Ensure that you're only want testing one variable at a time to find the actual solution. You know, if you've got a problem with your lead generation and you're struggling to find qualified leads, then you've got to change one thing at a time until you can see how that's performing. Because if you start like just making a drastic change, then you're not actually knowing what's fixing or breaking the system. Now, for the last thing on the lead nurturing, just be consistent and send enough volume. Now, especially as a beginner, you make up in volume what you lack in skill, i.e. even if your offer and outreach sucks, you can still get good results if you send enough volume. Now, where many people go wrong is doing outreach with a poor offer. You know, taking the time to do proper market research eliminates this problem and helps you offer something that people genuinely want and need. Now, so as, as mentioned, 50% of your market won't buy your offer anyway. So ensure that you're sending enough outreach to go beyond that 50% and find people who could buy your offer. And by following this, you will have qualified meetings coming in. But qualified meetings does not mean you're making money. So the next stage in the process and the final stage of client acquisition system is lead conversion. Lead conversion, which is the process of selling the product and exchanging our offer with the leads money. And this is what makes them a customer. So we're gonna get basically now into sales. Um, before we do understand, make sure again, if you need to rewind and rewatch something, go back, rewind, make sure you understand what I've been saying before we move on, okay? The, the stage that we just went through is just booking meetings. Booking meetings, just send outreach to people, make the outreach personalized, tell them what you can help them with, tell them about the problems that you can solve. Mention a case study if you have, use a call to action and send it. Follow up with people, track the leads that are engaged so you can follow up with people over a prolonged amount of time. And ultimately that's that's what you've got to do. You're just going to do that and you've got to do enough of it. Sending enough volume so you can actually go out and book those meetings. And you're going to get data. And if the data, if you're not booking enough meetings, then you know you want to go ahead and change something. One thing that I didn't mention that I want to, I want to mention because it's super important is the most important metric that you really want to be tracking, generally speaking, when it comes to booking meetings, is the appointment booking rate, the meeting book rate, rather. Ahead of that, you could look at the qualification rate to making sure that you're actually getting enough people show up to the calls. But generally speaking, you want to make sure that you're booking qualified appointments. So have a look how, like, what is your meeting book rate? As long as you're getting enough people booking in, then there will be a percentage of those people that you have to disqualify and you won't, be, you won't take the call with or you won't end up pitching. But that's okay. It's going to happen. It's it's never going to be 100%. So just be cool, be cool with it, but just make sure that you're tracking the metrics. As again, the most important metric that I generally look for is meeting book rate uh, and make sure that those you know calls are qualified, which is which is super important as well. Okay, so sales, <laughs> lead conversion. Now, <clears throat> in order to kick off this stage, you need people to be on a sales call with you. If they booked in but they did not attend, then you need to go back and look at your show up rate as this is likely the bottleneck that you're facing. The second thing here to consider is that when people go to your scheduler to book um, to book a call, you know, use a form to ask a few questions there to qualify them before they can actually go ahead and, and attend the call. And from their answers, you may have already canceled the call themselves. But if you didn't cancel and they showed up, you likely have a qualified prospect and it's fine to develop uh, it's time rather, it's time to develop your sales conversion approach. And this is essentially sales. Okay, so I, I didn't, just to dive in a little bit deeper there, what I mean is when people go to head, go ahead and book in a call with me, uh, we, use calendar, uh, we use a go high level for the calendar. What we do is we make sure that there's a little form that people have to fill out first. So they would tell them, like, tell us what's the main problems that they're facing. If they tell us a problem that we don't help with, like, 
a financial management or something that I'll just go ahead and I'll cancel the call and I'll message them and be like, hey, I can't help you out with this. And then they're not qualified. We don't get that very often. Um, we've never had somebody booking for that reason, in fact. So you want to use a form to make sure that they're qualified and make sure that when you're showing up to the call, you're showing up with somebody that has the problems you can solve and has the finances potentially to put into to buying that offer. And again, the way that we're looking at that is they, if they could buy, could they buy? If yes, then you go ahead. Okay. So again, if if you didn't cancel their call and they booked in and they showed up to the call, then you've got a sales call in your hands and you're good to go. Now, we already know that people buy desired states. They buy solutions to problems. They, they buy when they believe the transformation is possible with your solution. The sales process itself contains many sections. And for simplicity, we'll keep it at a high level and speak about the three main sections. These are discovery, pitch, and objection handling. Discovery. You ask them smart questions about their current situation, problems, and desired situations or states. If the discovery, if in, if with the discovery section you identify that they're a good fit, i.e., they're qualified for your offer, then you can pitch them. But make a habit of only pitching people who are a good fit. Continuing the call for practice makes no sense. You would be practicing with people you cannot help, and so your practice is ineffective. Pitching. With this stage here, what you want to do is essentially pitch your solution to the problems that the prospect outlined during the discovery. Now, the best way to pitch is listening care carefully to the problems and desired states and then selling that directly to them. If they told you that they want to make an extra 100K a month so they could free up more time to go traveling while paying off their, their children's tuition, then that's what you sell to them. If you pitch them your solution, explain how it would help them make the extra 100K a month while freeing up their time so they can travel to Dubai or wherever they want to go and pay off their children's 100K tuition fees. The more specific your pitch, the better. Make your pitch an offer about them and they will buy. Now, quick caveat, if somebody says they want to make 73,000 73, a month, when you get to the pitch, don't say, hey, we help people make 73,000 a month. That just seems a bit strange. But just like if they are looking for something that, you know, if they're looking for the type of goals that you can help them with, give them a range around their number and let them know that ultimately what you're offering will help them get to where they want to be. Okay. Now, if you make your pitch an offer about them, they will buy. And if somebody has the reaction of, this is exactly what's been missing for me achieving my goals, they will buy. But they have to believe that it's possible. And beliefs is where objection handling comes into play. Now, before we move on, in order for your pitch to be effective, not only must you be selling them their desired states, but you must have them believe that it's actually possible to achieve that with your help. During the discovery stage, you should ensure that they're in the position where they believe they can be successful with your offer. It's the right thing and now is the right time for them to do it. Your discovery questions are there to give you everything that you need to qualify them and then give them a personalized pitch and have them in a state of believing that they actually need your help. Ultimately, they wouldn't have gotten the call if they don't anyway. But if they believe that they can do it without you, they will not buy. And if they believe that your offer isn't worth the price, they will not buy. And so on and so forth from what we've already been discussing today. So you're probably seeing that marketing and sales is pretty much the same thing. You know, the marketing sells the sells the sales call and warms up the prospects to quote unquote prime, i.e. provide and uh, prepare them to actually purchase the offer. The warmer and more prime the person is, the more likely they are to buy your offer. So what if they don't buy? What if you have a great discovery section, your pitch tells them exactly what they need, but then they don't buy? Well, sometimes you're going to get some objections on your sales calls and objections are not rejections. They're not rejecting your offer. They have similar or they're not rejecting your offer. They have they just have some concerns or limiting beliefs that are coming up. Concerns like, is this actually going to work? Or limiting beliefs like using credit is irresponsible. Now, these could be both concerns and limiting beliefs. Ultimately, they want to make up, they make up what we call objections. And the most common objections you receive with the categories of objections are financial, partner, and fear. But the complication comes in where some people misdiagnose their objection or they're just not being 100% truthful with us in the first place. 
Sometimes people will be scared to make the jump, so they will just say it's financial. They will just say, I cannot afford it, which actually could translate to, if I pay for this, what will happen if it doesn't work, which is actually fear. Now, if they feel scared about making the decision themselves, they might say that they need to check with their team or their husband or wife. Now, what if the objection, I appreciate that they bring up a genuine concern and be happy about that. You know, they could have just said no and immediately ended the call. They could have ended the call 20 minutes ago. They're still here. They didn't and they're still there and potentially hoping that you can actually help them solve their concern or their limiting belief so they can access the offer. Now, understand that people want to buy, especially when the thing they're buying can change their life forever. But like, let me put it like this. If you had a proven and predictable process to help people add 30K a month in monthly recurring revenue, how much is that worth to them? 30k a month every single month for the rest of their lives like it's got to be worth at least three million pounds right and if they plan to be alive for the next 10 years if they plan to be alive for the next 10 years it's going to be worth at least three million pounds so if your offer does help them access that result and they say they can't afford it or it's irresponsible to use credit is that actually true well no it's a limiting belief like what do you mean you can't afford it you're putting in a few thousand and potentially if it were Pretend and providing it works, you're making back over three million pounds. So the limiting belief is the reason they're stuck where they are today. Accessing your offer is out of their comfort zone. It might create some financial issues in the short term, but in the long term, well, they can pay for their children's college tuition 30 times over if they need to. And that's a lot of kids. It's a lot of value. So if they're not buying, there's a limiting belief holding them back from achieving their desired states and lifestyle. Imagine the vision they have. If they don't buy the offer, they don't get it. It's just a dream. And people buy because you can make their dreams a reality. If they don't believe that you can do that, they won't buy. And if they don't believe that you can, yeah, excuse me. If, yeah, if they don't believe that you can do that, they won't buy. Also, if they have limiting beliefs that stop them from buying, they cannot achieve their dream life. So people don't buy ultimately because they don't believe that it's the right thing and now is the right time. Fundamentally, the quote unquote objection handling process is about you helping them see that this is that this is what would help them actually get to where they want to be. And you've probably seen people offering crazy guarantees. Well, why do they do that? They do it to increase what we can refer to as quote unquote, the perceived likelihood of success. And this means the more somebody believes that they will be successful, the more likely they are to purchase. When somebody gives you an objection, the first thing you do is always qualify, clarify what the real objection is. So for example, if they say it's too expensive, well, that could mean anything from they genuinely don't have the money. They don't have the money today, but they might tomorrow. They don't see the value. They don't like you or really anything else. By clarifying the objection, you can find what the real objection is. And you'll be able to see if their initial objection was a real objection or if it was what we call a smokescreen, i.e. something hiding their actual concern or limiting belief. Now, when somebody first reveals a concern, show them that you're cool and not offended. You know? No problem, I get that. Just to make sure that we're on the same page here, what do you mean when you say it's too expensive right now? And by doing this, they will confirm the objection. And from there, you can dive deeper into helping them overcome, overcome their concern or limiting belief. And remember, we're just exchanging value here. If your offer is worth more than the dollar figure you're asking for, they will buy. Think about it for a second. If I was selling tonight's lottery tickets, three million pounds, uh, and I was selling them for 10K, what would you do to find the money? Like genuinely, imagine this scenario for a second. I was selling tonight's lottery tickets, the, the, the winning drawer is three million, and you, you pay 10K to get that. Well, you'd maybe ask your friends. Maybe you'd give your dad a call, put it on a credit card, apply for a loan, ask your boss for an advance, or maybe you would even go a slightly more creative route. But chances are you would find the money. And so would your prospects. They just need to see that right here, you have today's, tonight's lottery ticket numbers. All the pain they are currently experiencing can be solved with your offer. You would help them achieve everything they think about when they look at their future life. If they believe you have what it takes, if they believe you have what would take them from their current situation to their desired situation, they will buy. And ladies and gentlemen, that 
is client acquisition. From the simplest, most rudimentary level to being a paying client, this is the process and system as a whole. If you master this, if you build upon everything that I've shared with you today, you too will become a true expert at client acquisition and realize just how simple it is. That said, there are a thousand different routes to take in solving the same problem. This is true for you as, as it is for your prospect, which one they take is ultimately up to them, just like the process and the next steps you make are ultimately up to you. But client acquisition as a whole, it's not, like, it's not too difficult when you break it down like this. So my goal for today in creating this training was to, to make something that could truly take you from being a beginner to being an expert in, in a way that you understand the fundamentals now from what I've been through today. You understand the fundamentals, you understand the principles. If you understand ultimately what's needed to get you to where you wanna be. So if you are an agency owner and you are currently experiencing a client acquisition problem and you would like my help with that, then click the link in the description below. It will tell you a little bit more about what we do, how we do it, who we've helped in the past, the results that they've achieved, and ultimately what it is and how we help people you know, what would master their client acquisition. So if you'd like that, click the link below. If not, that's totally fine. Click subscribe instead. Stay in touch with me. Keep watching the future videos. And ultimately, you'll probably have a few questions after this. So if you do, pop them down below in the comment section. I will reply to every single one. Make sure you get the help that you need. If you want to speak with me personally around a question that you've got to see if and how what I do would actually be able to help you, just message me on Facebook or Instagram. The link is in the description below as well. You can reach out to me there. I'll help you out. Hope you found this training valuable. It was fun to record this. Appreciate you spending an hour and 20 minutes with me today. Uh, but ultimately, I hope that it gave you everything. Uh, I mean, I'm confident it gave you everything you need. The next step is just to get out there and, and do the work. So I'm going to leave you to do that. Hit subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And I'll see you again in the next one. Take care and enjoy the rest of your week.